Okay, um, this is the second lesson in uh, magnetism and electromagnetism. This one is, uh, let me just change that, I've been auto focused. Okay, this is the second lesson in um, magnetism and electromagnetism. This is on motors and electromagnetic induction. Okay, this is a really important one. Uh, we'll look at the motor effect, um, Fleming's left hand rule, electromagnetic induction, transformers. We'll briefly talk about the national grid at the end. Um, so the motor effect, the first thing is, the motor effect, you'll remember, where we have a wire carrying a current in a magnetic field, the wire will feel a force. Now the reason it feels a force is because, as we've said before, around every current carrying wire there exists a magnetic field so we've, we've done this before and we've thought about if we've got a current carrying wire a magnetic field exists around that wire now because there's a magnetic field around the wire which carries a current a current carrying wire then that magnetic field will interact with the magnetic field that it's placed in now this is called the motor effect, Fleming's left hand rule. Fleming's left hand rule helps us to determine which direction the force will act. Okay? So if you remember, we take our thumb and our first finger and we try and put them at 90 degrees. Then we take our middle finger and try and place that at 90 degrees to our first finger. Now your first finger always points south. Always points south in the direction of the magnetic field. Your middle finger shows the direction of the current and your thumb will then show the direction of the force. So if we look at this example here, the magnetic field points south, so I'll put my first finger there. The current comes this way, so I'll put my this finger in the direction of the current and my thumb shows that this wire would move upwards if it were placed in this magnetic field. Now one of the main uses for this phenomenon is in the electric motor. So in the electric motor we have a current coming in and it comes in through a split ring commutator. And all that does is, as the current comes along and it flows here and it flows around the coil. Now we can use Fleming's left to show that. When it comes down here, the force on it will be down. So when it comes back this way, the force on it is in the opposite direction. So there's a force down and a force up, which turns the coil like this. Now if the current were attached to the two sides, then the coil would just feel a force and it would not spin. So we need to make sure that the side of the coil, which is always on this side, always feels a force pushing it downwards. And conversely, current on this side should always feel a force which pushes it upwards and that's where the split ring commutator comes in. The split ring commutator ensures that whichever side of the coil is on this side then the current will flow in this direction and when the coil rotates the other side of the split ring commutator will touch this brush and therefore the current will always flow around the coil in the same direction which means it will always feel forces in the same way, so the current will force the coil to spin in the same direction. It's really important we understand this phenomenon. Now moving on from there, we also need to look at something called electromagnetic induction. Now, if we remember, around every magnet exists a magnetic field. Now if we put our magnetic field into a coil of wire, then what happens is, whilst the field lines are cutting the coil, we say a voltage or a potential difference is induced in the wire. Now as this coil of wire is part of a complete circuit, we can say a current is induced in that wire. So when the magnet breaks, when it cuts the magnetic field lines, we induce a current in this circuit. And it's interesting to note, because we've got a voltmeter here, that when we push it one way, 
the voltage is induced in one direction and when we pull it in the other way the voltage is induced in the opposite direction and also if we flip our magnetic field lines then we get the opposite so if we change it to a south we get it in the opposite direction now this is called electromagnetic induction it is only happens whilst the magnetic field lines are being cut by the coil you do not induce a current whilst it is stationary another example of this is here so we know that around every bar magnet exists a magnetic field we also know that we can create this solenoid if you like using a current with a coil of wire this will create a magnetic field now if we then take our permanent bar magnet with its magnetic field and we move it into the coil of wire then we induce a current in the wire now in order to make this current larger what we could do is we could add more coils so by adding more coils we'll get a larger current and remember if we don't move it we do not induce a current in the wire now then scientists need to generate electricity so in order to generate electricity we need to make sure that we constantly have a coil of wire moving through a magnetic field or a magnetic field constantly cutting a coil of wire in order to do this all we need to do is we need to have a magnet with its magnetic field constantly cutting this coil of wire so in this example here we've got a magnet and around the magnet exists a magnetic field and as the magnet rotates next to this coil of wire the magnetic field is constantly cutting the coil of wire and therefore inducing a current in the wire now if we change this bulb for a voltmeter we can see it goes in one direction then the other direction and the reason that is is because we've got a north pole and a south pole and we're constantly changing the pole and that's why it goes in one direction then the other direction now if we want to induce a greater current then we would just rotate the magnet faster and that will induce a greater current in the coil of wire we could also have more coils this would induce a greater current as well or we could use a stronger magnet so that is called electromagnetic induction and it happens when a, a magnetic field is cutting a coil of wire and if we look this is why the electricity produced is an alternating current because if it, you've got a magnetic field in one direction and then the other now an application of this is called the transformer so if we think about the transformer we know that if we take a magnet and move it constantly into a, in a coil of wire we will induce a current in the wire so here we've got an electromagnet so if I take my electromagnet and I move it towards a coil of wire I am moving a magnetic field through a coil of wire and therefore I am inducing a current in the second coil but there must be a better way to do this rather than manually moving this coil of wire so what we can do is rather than using a direct current in this electromagnet we could use an alternating current by using an alternating current what we are effectively doing is we are creating a north pole and a south pole and a north pole and a south pole so we've got a constantly changing magnetic field inside this coil of wire so what that does is it induces a current in the secondary coil so here we've got a current in the first coil inducing the current in the second coil even though they are not connected electrically now the most famous example of this which you're likely to see in an exam is this and it looks like this now this is a soft iron core and we say it is a laminated soft iron core and the reason it's laminated is so it doesn't warm up because if it was not laminated the, the iron core itself would warm up and it would be less efficient now just to show you how this works in the primary coil we might have five coils of wire now we have to have we have to have an alternating current it must be alternating and this is called the primary coil now on this side of the coil I've got five on this side so I'll put 15 on this side now because we've got 
more coils on the secondary coil. This would be called a step up transformer. Now we could have a step up or a step down which would reduce the voltage going in. Now if we have a voltage of say 12 volts alternating current and what's happening is our 12 volts passes around the primary coil and that creates a magnetic field inside the magnet. Now when it does this the magnetic field flows like this and it cuts through the secondary coil therefore it induces a current in the secondary coil. Now because it's alternating it flows in one way then the other way and one way then the other way so because it's constantly changing we are constantly creating an alternating current in the secondary coil so we get an alternating current out because we've got a constantly changing magnetic field if this was DC we wouldn't get this if it was DC we turn it on it would come on it would flash on this side with electricity and then it would go off and stop but because it's alternating we've got a constantly changing magnetic field now then because we have five turns on the primary coil and we have 15 turns on the secondary coil the relationship is whatever the ratio is here we get the same ratio here now that's quite obvious this is three times bigger and therefore this would be 36 volts out now but the relationship is very very straightforward it's often written the voltage on the primary coil divided by the voltage on the secondary coil equals the number of turns on the primary coil divided by the number of turns on the secondary coil. These ratios can be written any way you like but that is a simple formula so that it works with more complicated numbers. Remember the reason it's that, the, that the soft iron core is laminated is so it doesn't get too hot and therefore waste energy. Um, soft iron is easily magnetized and demagnetized so the magnetic field is easily flipped. Now then, these are used in, trans transformers are used in the national grid, they use them to mobile phone chargers, in laptop chargers, in, in all sorts of electronic devices, but they're used on the national grid. So when electricity is generated on the national grid, so if we have a power station and it generates electricity, the electricity comes off the power station and it goes through a step-up transformer and then it goes on to the national grid and then it comes down through a step-down transformer and then it goes to factories and it might go through another step-down transformer before it goes to houses. Now, so the electricity would go to a step-up transformer onto the national grid where it would travel for a very long distance. It would then be stepped down, it might be stepped down through more transformers as you go to villages and towns, and then stepped down again to the houses. Now the reason they do this is because electrical current generates heat. And if you're transmitting electricity over long distances and, you, and it creates heat, then you're wasting much of the energy that you've created in your power station. However, if you transmit the electricity at very high voltages, the current will fall off, it will get very small. And it's the current that causes heat. So what we need to do is reduce the current. Now if I show you this mathematically, just to illustrate the point. If a power station generates one megawatt of electricity, that's a million watts. Now let's pretend it does it at 25 thousand volts. So if we think about this using the equation P is VI we need to think well how many 25,000 are in a million? So the current must be 40 amps. So the current coming out is 40 amps. You do not want to transmit electricity at 40 amps because of the amount of wastage. So by stepping it up in a step-up transformer you might step this voltage up to say 400,000 volts. Now some people might say, well this doesn't make sense. You can't have electricity for nothing. But you're not getting electricity for nothing. You're just stepping up the voltage. So therefore the power is the same, so the current must drop off. It must get smaller. 
So if we think about it as being 100% efficient, if you've got a million watts there, we must have a million watts here and a million watts here. In reality, it's not 100% efficient, but if we assume it is, and if we've got a million watts, the current here must have fallen to two and a half amps. So the current's gone down from 40 amps to two and a half amps. Now that low current generates hardly any heat and therefore we don't waste energy on the national grid whilst we're transmitting the electricity for hundreds of miles. When it reaches close to its destination it passes through a step down transformer and this will reduce the voltage, it steps it down to about 11,000 and then when it gets to houses it steps down again to about 250 volts. Now if we think about this, it's 230, 240 volts but mathematically it's easier if you just think of 250. If you've got a million watts and you divide that by 450, then now we've got enough amps to now service many, 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 many houses, okay? Um, because all of a sudden we've got 4,000 amps here. And if a typical house is taking no more than 100, then we've got enough electricity there to service at least 40 homes. Now, in reality, this would be a far greater number of watts. So this is why step up and step transformers are used on the national grid.